I'm actually uh, Jewish. I'll be showing you in just a few minutes. We'll bring the jib in close. I call it a jib to show my giblets. I actually have been circumcised nine times. Enjoy the calamari. On January 7th, 2022, Bob Saget, the stand-up comedian, lovable TV dad from the sitcom Full House, checked into room 962 at the Ritz-Carlton Orlando Grand Lakes in Florida. By all accounts, the 65-year-old was in very good spirits, cracking jokes with hotel employees and waving to people in the lobby. Stand-up comedy was Saget's first love and the one true passion in his life. He absolutely loved being on stage, catching people off guard with his set, boyishly relishing in the moment that people realized the man best known for being a squeaky sitcom dad could actually unleash some of the most twisted, raunchy, filthy jokes when he grabbed the microphone. The next night, Saget performed at the Ponte Vedra Concert Hall in Jacksonville, which is about a two to three hour drive from the hotel. The house was packed. Audience members say Saget seemed humbled by the turnout and actually ended up performing for nearly two hours, covering everything from cancel culture to his thoughts on his late friend Norm MacDonald, who'd passed away just a few months earlier in September. Nothing was amiss. At around 12.42 a.m., he even tweets a selfie from the venue after the show and said he was happily addicted again to this shit, telling his fans to check back for more tour dates in 2022. It would be his last time on a stage. I'm Derek Kaufman. I'm Jason Beckerman. And this is Last Days, Bob Saget. After the show in Jacksonville, Bob made the long drive back to Orlando. Surveillance footage shows Bob walking up to the main doors of the hotel, posing for a quick photograph with a hotel valet named Orlando Nunez outside the lobby, and then walking up to his room. Key card records show that his hotel room was last accessed at 2.17 a.m. on the morning of January 9, which is also consistent with witness accounts from the hotel. Bob was supposed to check out that morning and take a flight to Los Angeles. When family members didn't hear from him by that afternoon, they contacted the hotel and asked security to check his room. A hotel staff member used an emergency key that afternoon at 3.53 p.m., where Saget was discovered in bed, unresponsive, and cold to the touch. The hotel employee immediately called 911. We have an unresponsive guest in a room. My officer is telling me that he, that there's no pulse. Paramedics were immediately dispatched to the hotel, but Saget was pronounced dead at the scene shortly later. Yeah, so Jason, what exactly transpired during the 13 hours in between that period when he entered the hotel room and when he was found and pronounced dead has been the subject of a lot of speculation. But here's what was learned from the investigations that were conducted in the aftermath. The police report made the following findings. First, the officer said the hotel suite was described as, quote, neat and mostly unused. Officers noted there was no evidence of a struggle, any type of foul play, or that anyone else was even in the room at any time during his stay. They did describe the room as mostly carpeted, with the exception of some wood flooring in the entry hall and closet and some marble tile in the bathroom. The room looked like it had been barely inhabited at all, except that one of the hotel drinking glasses appeared to have been used. Nothing out of the ordinary with that. And there were toiletries in the shower and near the sink, and Bob's cell phone was on his nightstand. Second, there was no sign of any blood or bodily fluids on the white bed sheets or anywhere else in the room. Bob was actually discovered lying on his back on the right side of the bed, partially covered by the sheet and bedspread, with his left arm lying loosely across his torso and his right arm by his side. Bob's body didn't display any significant indications of trauma or injury, aside from some slight swelling and a small bruise in the corner of his left eye. Third, it did not appear that drugs or alcohol played any role in Bob's death, his luggage contained several over-the-counter medications and four different prescriptions, all of which he seemed to have used as prescribed. And this lined up with a statement from an employee at the Hard Rock Live in Orlando, where Bob had performed on January 7. He reported that Saget requested only non-alcoholic drinks, Diet Coke, Red Bulls in his green room, and has consistently told people that he wasn't much of a drinker and didn't really like being around drunk people. The employee described Saget as friendly, outgoing, talkative, and said he never noticed any signs of impairment. And fourth, Derek, officers surveying the scene noticed the adjoining room, 961, was unlocked. But it turned out the room had been vacant for days, and there were no signs that anyone had occupied the room since the last guest checked out a few days earlier on January 7. 
And according to hotel records, the door had been closed and secure between 2.36 p.m. on January 7 and 3.09 p.m. on January 9, the day that Saget's body was found. So we've got the makings of a real mystery here, and it became clear that we'd have to look deeper to find out what exactly happened to Bob Saget. There were no signs of forced entry and no nobody, no sign of a struggle in this room, yet you have a 65-year-old man who was in otherwise good health and good spirits was found dead in his bed. So the description of the scene really left people with more questions than answers. And then the autopsy came out and things only got even murkier. So the official finding from the autopsy was that Bob Saget had died from blunt head trauma And the manner of death was ruled to be accidental. Specifically, the chief medical examiner, Josh Stefani, pointed to a significant fracture at the base of Saget's skull that caused bleeding around his brain. The medical examiner found that the fracture came from a blow that was so forceful and intense that it actually broke the orbital bones at the front of his skull. So imagine being hit in the back of your skull and reverberating to such an extent that you break your orbital bones. You and I were talking before we went on air tonight, and I, I can't reconcile this. I've never heard of a blow to the back of the head so forceful that it actually, just by the force of the blow to the back, breaks the eye socket. In the front of the uh, of the skull, it's it's remarkable. I've never heard of that before. It's remarkable, and you saw it in the scene they had some swelling around his yeah. eyes. So, but these were all internal injuries. Internal. So, so the the blow is so forceful to the back of the head that it actually breaks the eye socket at the front of the head and does not break the skin at the back of the head. It's a remarkable occurrence because, as you're saying, a blow that forceful, you'd think when you crack your head on on the pavement, you'll have an external injury. You'll have blood there, and that would be forceful enough to maybe break your eye socket. But for everything to be internal, because there was no external bleeding, these white bed sheets were perfectly sort of unsoiled by any fluids and no blood. So the speculation was that this injury had to be suffered from impact with something hard, enough to inflict the injury, covered by something soft. So then you start looking at the hotel room. What in there was soft enough? Now, there was a carpeted floor. You've been in hotel rooms a lot. A lot of times the carpet is a thin layer, low pile carpet that is on a hard surface. Perhaps a fall on that could inflict this kind of injury. The bathroom uh, was nearly completely tile. So it would be unlikely to fall with enough force and not crack your head Although on the tile. Although we have seen photos from the bathroom and there is a bath mat that That's is right. laid out on the bathroom floor. It's very thin. It's a, it's, a, it's a towel bath, not, not anything with any cushion to it. But it's, it's laid out on the tile floor. That could potentially be something that, that they would have looked at. That's right. It's right in front of the sink, and you can imagine bathrooms get wet. There's moisture. You get out of the shower. You can imagine a slip and your head hitting that mat and maybe causing that type of injury. But as, as it develops, you'll, you'll see what the theories that sort of popped up and what they were able to conclude. Now, it's believed that this blow to the head would have stunned Saget. I mean, this is the type of injury, you know, we all bump our head on door frames and things of that nature. Sea but stars, the whole sea thing. Sea stars, but this, the, the extent of the trauma that caused the orbital bone to break and caused the brain bleed would have caused some confusion, would have caused some balance issues, may have slurred his speech a bit. But because he was alone, remember, he was in this hotel room, he was touring, his family was back in Los Angeles. He was supposed to go on the plane to meet them the next day. It's possible that he felt the back of his head to see if there was any bleeding and then simply decided, hey, I'll sleep this off. Now, the medical examiner noted that such an injury almost certainly happened at the hotel that night. I want to emphasize that because there was no way Saget could have gotten in his car after the final set that he performed and driven three hours after sustaining an injury like this. So so what could have caused the injury ultimately? That This is what investigators were looking into. They canvassed the room to determine what might have Get, that what sort of surface, as we were discussing, would have provided the the what could inflict this the hardness that would cause to inflict the injury, but the softness so there was no external bleeding. They ruled out countertops, tables, nightstands, other hard furniture for the figu- for the reasons we were just saying. On the other end of the spectrum, the chairs, couches are heavily upholstered with thick pl- thick padding, which would be too soft to inflict this type of skull fracture, regardless of the force of the fall or the impact. No matter how hard you dive onto a couch, you're not going to crack your skull and break your orbital, it's, orbital it's bone. It's a little like Goldilocks, right? You're looking for something that is perfectly uh, suitable to inflicting this injury without external bleeding. So investigators zeroed in on the headboard, which they said was lightly padded and set out slightly from the wall. It's possible this is just really was an operating theory without any supporting forensic evidence like hair or DNA that Saget lost his balance or misjudged the distance of the headboard, plopped into bed thinking the headboard was more padded and suffered the fatal injury. 
In the end, the medical examiner stated that it was, quote, most probable that the decedent suffered an unwitnessed fall backwards and struck the posterior aspect of the head but somewhere in the But they didn't say on what? So I, I remember when this story broke, and it was everywhere, everything everywhere all at once, it right? It was everywhere, yes. And the, this this headboard theory came out, and the photos of, it, of the headboard came out, and they, they showed a padded headboard, not very thickly padded, but padded. And people said, well, he may have thrown himself back into the into the padded headboard and hit his head with such force that it caused this kind of injury. I've never I, – it's not that I don't buy it because I have to defer to the medical examiners, but I can't get my head around it. Who – what what sort of, you know, 60-year-old man, right, throws himself back into bed with such force – let's assume he misjudged how f- far back the headboard was sure. – but throws himself backwards onto the bed with such force – that he hits a padded headboard and cracks the back of his skull with the, ex- the force being so extraordinary that, again, it broke that orbital bone in the front of his, in front of his skull. I, I can't get my head around that as a plausible explanation for what happened. Because it's hard to imagine. It sounds like a million in one shot that all of these things could come together, that he threw himself with a, enough force against the bed, that the bed, which was described, that headboard, as being lightly padded and set slightly out from the wall. If you look at the pictures, there's a few pictures online of the hotel room. There's tufting, and then there's a separate layer of tufting, and it looks like it may be out a little bit from the wall. But your back of your head would have to hit it in such a perfect manner or imperfect manner, depending on how how you look at that, to cause that type of injury. So remember, the autopsy report can only go so far. What is happening is medical examiners looking at the injury, knowing that the brain bleed caused the death, and then trying to work backwards into a scenario. But we have a black box. We have ingress into the room at 2.17 p.m., and the only time later is when the hotel staff went in and discovered the dead body. Those 13 hours will never be talk, sort of resolved. Talk about that for a second, because there was a lot of speculation in the wake of sort of a, an unfinished product here, right? There yep. was no real conclusion about exactly what happened. Talk about this ingress and egress issue with the card swiping and how the hotel monitors and the records they have for who swipes in and who swipes out. Yeah, so hotels, they, all modern hotels, including the one Bob was staying at, uh, Ritz Carlton, very fancy, right? It's a, it, it's a very high end hotel. Cu- cutting edge technology they have here, which is important for the story. It's exactly here. right. So you can tell exactly by the key card when it was accessed to unlock the door, but you can also tell when the door was accessed in any in any manner to be opened or closed because there's a strike plate. And they have this connected to a computer, and they can just look back at the records to see when the door was opened so, and closed. So that rules out, for example, and this was a wild speculation was happening here as we talked about. This rules out the fact that Bob might have gotten a visitor That's later right. in the night. He gets back to his hotel room. He swipes the key card at 236. He enters the room. It's impossible that a visitor would have come in because he would have had to open the door for that visitor, and that would have been recorded on the computer system, all of which the examiner, examiners looked at. They looked at the computer exactly. system, and they know exactly when it was up, and it was just not opened after he went up. They also know that he went up to the room alone in the first instance. And the reason we know that is a few moments before going up to the room, there's a photograph of Bob Saget with Orlando Nunez, the valet, at around 2.13 a.m. So remember, he accesses his room at 2.17. Uh, he takes the photo with the valet late at night after having a nice conversation. There's just no time for a visitor. He was unaccompanied. The guy says he spoke with Bob for a period of time. They took the selfie together, and then he heads up the uh, elevator to his room and there was really no time for anyone and else to be Just to, to close there. the loop. Remember, the room was found in complete, a completely untouched way. Yes, the, no the, struggle. The, the, only one side of the bed had been disturbed, the side that he was in. There was no struggle. There was one water glass. I mean, we can— cell phones there. Nothing was taken. Right. We can concoct any theories we, we want in our heads, but none of them stand up to an examination of the facts. That's right. And, and so— th- we do have to. So the autopsy report also includes uh, other health conditions that were discovered during the autopsy. Um, Bob Saget did have an enlarged heart. He had some hardening of the arteries. Remember, he's a 65 year old man. You're going to have other health conditions uh, that don't lead to your deaths. And he also had a positive test for COVID-19. He had talked about this before. Um, he had recovered in the weeks leading up to his death. It's possible he had some lingering effects from the COVID, but none of these were determined to have played any sort of role in his death. Uh, speculation aside, maybe you have long COVID, maybe you have some balance issues, well, there are things I, that I, can contribute I, to it. I, I mean, any any explanation that you know that's consistent with the facts we have is that he fell. Yes. Either one theory would be on the, on the wet bathroom floor. 
if it's not on the wet bathroom floor, then it took, he passed out of some kind. Because in order to have this, sustain this kind of injury with this sort of trauma... You have to have not broken your fall You have to have not arm. broken your fall. Th- I mean, I suppose you have the throwing yourself back against the headboard, but I still don't know what kind of 65-year-old man throws himself onto a bed right. and goes, wee, and hits the back of their head, right? Right. This is a fall from distance onto the ground, so you're assuming it was an uncontrolled fall. Either you're, you're passing out or, or slipping and falling. So then you look at, did he have any prescription in his blood tre- stream? You know, th- he's an older gentleman. He does have some prescriptions. Could any of those cause some disorientation, some loss of balance? But they were all being, the, the levels in his bloodstream were deemed consistent with the ordinary usage of those prescription medications. They shouldn't have caused the type of balance issue that would cause a fall like this. Um, it's possible that the lingering effects, as I said, of COVID combined with the exhausting night on a, on stage and the long drive. Remember, it's two seventeen in the morning when he arrives back he's at the gotta hotel. He's got to be completely exhausted. Not with the diet cokes and Red Bulls. He's got to be completely exhausted by this point. Yeah, you can imagine maybe a momentary loss of balance. Sometimes I have something called orthostatic hypotension, where you stand up and you know you're a little bit lightheaded. It could have been one of those moments that just went terribly, terribly awry at the wrong time. And, and going back to the point you mentioned earlier about how he hit his head at some point and just went to bed. I think that's what a lot of people would do. It's what I think you and I would do, frankly. You yep. suffer a huge fall. You reach the back. There's no bleeding. And you think, you know what? That was a scary fall. I'm going to go to bed now and just I'll wake up in the morning. I'll probably have a headache. And, you know. That's what's h- so scary about it. It sounds yeah. so ordinary. You're it right. sounds like you might have done right. the same thing. In hindsight, of course, you should have called 911 when you have that kind of fall. But that's not the way people typically go about things. That's right. So in the weeks after the autopsy is released, many internet sleuths search the more intriguing an- for more intriguing answers. And sort of recklessly speculated about the cause and manner of Saget's death. His family fought to block the release of additional photos and other evidence after the autopsy report, which is completely allowable under Florida law in the wake of NASCAR legend Dale Earnhardt's death a couple of uh, decades earlier. Records related to autopsies are required to be confidential in Florida with only surviving family members or governmental agencies as part of their official duties allowed to view them. So the family argued against the release of these photos, uh, saying that it would cause them extreme mental pain, anguish, emotional distress. And all some of the hotel room, uh, hotel room photos were released, the court ultimately agreed that releasing the autopsy pics wouldn't serve any overriding public interest. But predictably, Derek, you know, when any, ever anybody tries to stop anything from being released, there are allegations of a cover-up that are happening. So there are sort of, you know, again, conspiracy theorists throwing around the family didn't want us to see the true nature of his death. That's really unfair. I yeah, think. they He's, were in a bit of a bind. They didn't want uh, pictures of their loved ones splash over the it's Internet. It's really horrible. I mean, it's horrendous. Yeah, two, two somewhat young kids, uh, you know, at home, they don't want this kind of thing out there. It's really terrible when this kind of thing happens. Uh, and the law doesn't require it. So I don't, you can't fault the family in any way for saying, you know what, we have the lo- law on our side to stop the release of these photos, and we really don't want them out there. On the other side, you can understand the p- uh, curiosity of the public's uh, interest being piqued. I mean, we've just talked about this for several minutes. It is an odd manner of death. The way he sort of struck his head and died of a brain bleed uh, naturally led people to ask more questions. And that's why there were so many questions. But in the end of the day, the autopsy said what it said uh, in the exact precise way in which Bob uh, suffered this injury may never be known. And and, it's, and that's what's sort of frustrating about yeah. it. And you and I talk all the time. We talk about, in the nature of our jobs, we talk about people's deaths all the time. I've never had one that defied explanation quite like this one does. I still cannot understand how he fell, but there's no evidence of the fall anywhere. And cracked not only the back of his skull, I keep going back to this because it, it boggles the mind, yeah. but also cracked his orbital bone based on the fall on his on the back of his head. I, ju- I cannot get my head around that. You and I, we've lived our lives. I've never heard of anything even remotely similar to this. I, I couldn't agree more. So the mysterious nature of his passing obviously generated a ton of interest. I remember what it was like in our newsroom. I mean, there were days and days of speculation and follow-up stories. Um, and the enormity of the response, I think, to Bob Saget's passing was really driven by what I think of as the fundamental duality of Bob Saget's place in popular culture. So first, Saget's passing profoundly impacted an entire generation of millennials who grew up watching him host the first eight seasons of America's Funniest Home Videos, which was a gigantic show. Yeah, I mean, we a, think of it as quaint now. It's yeah. still on the air, by the way. Is that right? That show Who is still now? on the air. Who hosts it now? Uh, I don't know the is exact Tom Bergeron host. doing it for Bergeron a while? It was Bergeron for years. It was yeah. Saget for a number of years. They're the two longest standing hosts, but you can still oh, tune you know who does up. it? Alfonso Rivera does it. Yeah, Alfonso Rivera That's did right. it as well. Yeah, yeah. So it is still one of these zeitgeisty shows and really um, sort of predicted where we'd be at in culture a lot. Yeah, I mean, yeah. these were short snippets <laughs> right, of funny right. videos. YouTube before 
before YouTube. It was right? YouTube before YouTube. Um, and of course, he was Danny Tanner on eight seasons of Full House. So although he was never sort of a critical darling, I mean, we've done an episode on James Gandolfini. That's not who Bob Saget was. The series... Uh, you know, sort of laid down a marker as quite simply one of the most popular shows on television during the 90s. Uh, one of its producers call, called it the Brady Bunch of the 90s, which gives you a sense of its sort of cultural footprint. Uh, during its initial run, though, it was a juggernaut for ABC. It carved out a fam family friendly niche in the network in network television. Uh, the show was consistently in the Nielsen Top 30 from its second season onward and took on a new life in syndication. You could just watch it endlessly on a loop. Um, as the widowed father of three daughters, Saget dispensed this sort of dorky wholesomeness and morality that viewers just really connected to during its run. Okay, look, I'm going to tell you something, but you got to keep it a secret, all right? I told Tommy what a big fan Stephanie is, and he agreed to stop by her party after school today. Dad, Stephanie! I know. Am I the raddest, baddest dad a kid ever had? You were until you said that. So Saget led his sidekicks, brother-in-law Jesse, played by Jez John Stamos, best friend Joey, played by comedian Dave Coulier, generate the zany laugh line. Stamos and Saget became so close during their time in the show, they literally became best friends, which is not as common as you might think on television with all the big egos in Hollywood. One of the many heartbreaks about it specifically was that he didn't know how loved he was. And it was a tsunami of love for him. Yeah. And uh, I just, th that part really breaks my heart. He was such a, you know, you guys knew him. He was such a good man. And, 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 you know, obviously one of the real lasting legacies of that show was how famous the kids became. You have the Olsen twins uh, leading the pack. Uh, they played Little Michelle. But it's important to remember that they all spent many hours on set during their formative childhood years and really looked up to Saget as a paternal figure. Candace Cameron, who played Zagat's oldest daughter, DJ, on the show, reflected on the impact of his death in a way that sounds eerily similar, Derek, to the way that Jamie Lynn Siegler talked about the sudden passing of James Gandolfini. Bob was available and there for everyone that he knew. But Bob, Bob was that person that no matter what happened, Bob would drop anything for you in a second, in a heartbeat. And you didn't even have to be his best friend for him to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how huge his heart was. Yeah, so Saget easily could have coasted through the rest of his life on residuals from Full House, um, just started signing autographs at conventions. But that's not what happened. So the si second element of Bob's personality was that Bob was widely respected in the world of stand-up comedy, and much of his post-Full House life was spent uh, surprising people with his trademark filthy brand of humor and introducing them to this other side of his personality without ever really alienating those old fans who loved Full House and the dorky sitcom dad. So the first time I and many other people encountered this version of Bob, the raunchy guy, was in the movie The Aristocrats, um, which is a 2005 movie about an old dirty joke dating back to the vaudeville days that modern stand-up comedians reverentially use and put their own spin on it to show their chops as comedians. Gilbert Gottfried famously brought this joke out at the Friars Club roast of Hugh Hefner to recover on stage after he got booed over a 9-11 joke just 18 days after 9-11. So during this documentary, Bob Saget tells an impossibly dirty, almost virtuosic, complex version of this joke with incest, diarrhea, vomit, more. And he's just absolutely relishing. He breaks up during telling it. He's laughing to himself. The comedian behind the camera is laughing. Um, and it's pretty incredible moment. It's hard to play all of it, but we'll play you a little snippet. But honestly, just do yourself a favor and Google it. Some people think I have a reputation of being a dirty comedian, and I don't really want to expose that anywhere because I think I'm you know I'm really a family kind of uh, oriented guy which brings me to this joke <laughs> <laughs> w once that the cat was out of the bag on this joke and about his 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 you pension know, for this. <laughs> yes. He seemed to become much looser in his public persona, but the fundamental kindness never really faded. He was always so friendly with everybody he met out in the in the world, and you could start to see the glint of mischief in some of his answers as he got more comfortable letting people in on his body sense of humor. On America's Funniest Home Videos, you've probably right. been asked this. Yes. What was your all-time favorite funny video? Uh, the monkey sniffing his butt and then passing out of a tree <laughs> from the smell of his own butt. But that, that, I've was... talked about it a lot, and then they finally aired it years later. It was these twin personas, the squeaky clean sitcom dad and the filthy uncle telling jokes to make the kids laugh at Thanksgiving that really was the essence of who Bob Saget was. It wasn't a sinister dark side like other popular sitcom dads that couldn't go unmentioned. 
it was just Saget, and he loved playing up this duality. One of the last projects he did was playing a chef cooking bacon in, des in a designer rap video. He was fully on the joke. You could see how excited all the young producers on the film set were, on the music video set were, and when they got to meet the Full House dad. So let's we should pause here and think about a, sort of a bit of a counterfactual, which we like to do on this show from time to time. Where, where do you see Bob Saget going if he hadn't suffered this sort of tragic fall in the hotel room and passed away? He was 65 years old, but he was so active. Uh, he was in stand-up. He loved doing roasts and all those things. Where, where would you see him going? So one of the things that, that came out after his death was that how many young comedians revered him. Yeah. And older com comedians did too. People of his generation certainly did as well. But younger comedians absolutely revered him. He was one of the, it was kind of a remarkable outpouring of people that you would never associate with Bob Saget's brand of humor. Came out and talked about how much they loved him and admired him. They'd met him. He, had, he always did solids for young comedians, gave up some of his stage time for them, that sort of thing. And so you got to think that he really would have continued to do that. I mean, his life seemed very full. It's hard to know what happens inside of a man's home or whatever it is, but it seemed very w full. He had a really lovely relationship by all accounts with his wife and his kids. He was traveling constantly, doing his first love, his first passion, which was stand-up. you got to believe that he would have continued to do this indefinitely and passed down to the next generations of comedians, which was really his sort of trademark. I think you're exactly right. He would have stayed in stand-up. He would have helped lift up young comedians, but he also had the best of both worlds. Remember, when he passed, the, the spin-offs of Full House were still going on. Whoa. Fuller House is a whole uh, sort of franchise unto itself. There are projects that are in development to have more spin-offs, and although he wasn't the lead of those shows, he would always participate. You know, yeah. he, he got to sample and go back into that sitcom realm, and he was always accepted because even even though he would do these filthy jokes, the thing about Bob Saget is he was not mean spirited. No. So it would never turn you off in that sitcom role. Uh, you could accept him as Danny Tanner, even though now you knew he would tell dirty jokes on stage. And he was able to ride both of those elements of his personality uh, expertly. There's really a poignant coda to Bob Saget's life. Like many comedians, Bob had a popular podcast during the last few years of his life called Bob Saget's Here For You. The podcast usually featured Bob casually chatting with friends, bringing his trademark blend of heartfelt empathy with totally raunchy humor. On many occasions, it felt like Bob was using the podcast as a platform to show his listeners that he was equally comfortable dispensing pearls of wisdom like Danny Tanner and plumbing the depths of depravity like the filthy comedic offspring of Lenny Bruce and Don Rickles. Uh, his particular focus on October 25th, 2021, Bob Saget and his wife, Kelly Rizzo, posted an episode of Bob's podcast. Uh, and on this particular episode, Bob and Kelly were discussing how they loved curling up and binging TV shows and movies during the pandemic. While he, she preferred TV, he was a big fan of movies. You but love there's five something. movies. You love Big Lebowski <laughs> every day. You could watch Big Lebowski four Big times Lebowski, a day. The Godfather. Uh, Wayne's World, <laughs> uh, Godfather 2, Goodfellas, Casino, Scarface. Um, but so I don't have long to live. These are your favorites. I'm going to be found dead in bed. You know, it's an adorable exchange. It's tossed off without much thought. It's showing sort of genuine love between a couple, but... It wasn't really particularly notable. However, this offhand comment uh, showing sort of cutesy banter between Bob and his wife in the wake of his death, people seized on this clip and they posted it as evidence of some sort of eerie foreshadowing because he mentioned dying in bed. But it always struck me as sort of a, a cheap and stupid observation, the, the kind that get posted for a quick headline and some easy clicks, but wasn't really foreshadowing any way. It, if anything, it just showed his warmth and, and generosity of his spirit and who Bob was. But I never sort of liked those headlines, but I felt remiss not to, to at least mention that that happened. But if you watch the entire exchange with Kelly, you, you get a lot more. It's a window into who he is. It's that warmth. It's that generosity. It's his empathy. It's his interest in other people. And it's that little impish, mischievous sense of humor. So I wanted to leave the final word with John Mayer, who a lot of people didn't know was really good friends with Bob Saget. Um, and when Bob died, because he died in Florida and never took that flight back to Los Angeles, uh, they had to retrieve his car from LAX where he left it. And Jeff Ross, a famous comedian from all the roasts, and, and John Mayer went and retrieved the car and spent the day riding in it, just reminiscing about their friend. And really, I should just give them the final word. I've just never known a human being on this earth who could give that much love individually and completely to that many people. 
in a way that made each person feel like he was a main character in their life yeah. and they were a main character in his life.